And I want to welcome you, those that are visiting with us this morning. And I trust as we go, we're going to do an introduction. I'm not for, so sure how far we may get along with it. Uh, we are conscious of our time. But wherever we reach, we will stop because it's a continuation. So we're going to start with part one in dealing with Hebron. I've not done a slide for this as yet because I just want to do an introduction. When we go into part two, we will rehearse it and go it over and have the slide so it allows you to follow through. But Hebron is strange. You will say, well, why Hebron? Well, the Spirit of God put it into my, into my spirit to say, I want you to share this because Hebron is very significant. I think where we are as a church, and even for more so those that are part of our, our family, part of, our, of the Zywell family, it's important that we come into that place that is called Hebron. It's a very significant place. So we come into the place that is called Hebron. The church in Rome is now 20 years in existence, and Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthian church, and he's addressing the problem of unity, of unity. Conflict between the Jews and Gentile believers over the preferences of food and the observation of holy days. Here is a clear indication that it does not take long for us to get out of focus. It does not take long for us to lose our focus or to our focus can become very blurred. While this may seem a trivial matter, it is more complicated as any serious theological matters. The story was told of two local churches uh, only a block away from each other felt that it would be wiser if we can merge into one larger and stronger congregation. And so plans was in motion for this merger to happen. It never happened. Why? They could not agree on the wording of the Lord's Prayer. One congregation wanted, forgive us our trespass, and the other preferred, forgive us our debts. A newspaper article reported the failure of the merger and noted that one group went back to their trespass and the other group went back to their debts. What am I going ahead into? The conflict in the Corinthian church was based on loyalty to individuals. And it was dividing the church. And Paul had to address this. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 to 13. We're going to look at some scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 to 13. And we're going to read. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the what? Same thing, that you speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you. Now, Paul was writing the Corinthian church. Hmm? Paul was addressing the church. And you would think that in the church of Jesus Christ, there is no division. But that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. One translation says that you, that you all agree with one another in what you say and that there be no division among you, that you be perfectly united in mind and in thought. What it says. Verse 11. My brothers and sisters, some from Cleo's household, and informed me that there are quarrels among you, contention among you. Verse 12. He says, some say that I, am, I follow Paul, and some say I follow Apollos, and I follow Cyphus, and still another, and I follow Christ. And all these followings is causing a division among church. He says in verse 13, but Christ is not divided. Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? What's happening here? The church as current was struggling to maintain the unity amongst brethren, and it was very apparent that because they were struggling to, to have unity among them, they could never come into oneness. Into oneness. The church of Jesus Christ is not about unity. 
The church of Jesus Christ is about oneness. For too long we have been taught of we need to be united. We need to come together in unity. But when we come into the new covenant in the New Testament, it is not about unity, it is about oneness. And we're going to dive into that and I'm going to blow your mind of how God has expanded this thing and we missed it. And that's why I want to take you for Hebron. Because Hebron speaks about friendship. Hebron speaks about oneness. We cannot come to Hebron if we are only satisfied in being united. When one looks at the landscape of Christianity, we must ask ourselves the question, are the differences that we have dividing the body of Christ justifiable? There is still one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all, who is above all. Ephesians 4, 5. And should these differences still seem relevant? The things that they are disagreeing about was the non-essential things in which the love and liberty needed to be extended. Sadly, the task of Paul still remains unfulfilled. How can a body which is jointly fitted together not work in unison? How can a body that is jointly fitted together not work in unison? And so the scripture would bring us to the point, and he says, the Lord adds to the church daily such as should be saved. And he went on to explain that some can be the hands, and some can be the feet, and some can be the head, and wherever, but we are fitted, but we are still one body that needs to operate as one complete unit. And yet when we watch the body, that the body, if it don't function in unison, if it don't function in oneness, it cannot perform. And Christ is saying, this is how the church is. So we are, we are called this morning to shift our understanding of unity. The church is called to graduate from its pursuit of unity into a place of oneness. And I'm hoping by the end of this series, we will all grasp it and we'll come into that place. One writer says, you can tie two alley cats by their tail on a clothes line. And you would see an example of them being in, in unity, but yet not unified. Because they will fight each other. A pack of wolves can be united for the wrong purpose. So God is not just having a united church. He's having a church that comes into oneness. So what has happened? And I speak in general. The church has become sectors of person who has common goals. And we are yet to learn how to be one. So what we have in the church of Jesus Christ is that different sectors, we may call them cliques, sectors and bodies of the church that come together because they have common goals or common likeness. And we choose who we want to talk to and who we want to associate with in the house of God and we tell ourselves that we have a united church but we are not unified because we have still not come into a place of oneness. Our journey for the next few weeks is going to take us into a rich understanding of this place that is called Hebron. But as we study the place and as we are called into this place that is called Hebron, I want the revelation of the word of God. Let it leave uh, the pages that I'm sharing with you today. Let it incarnate within us. Let that word become flesh as I flesh it out to you so that changes can take place. Are you ready to go this morning? Numbers chapter 13, verses 21 to 25. Let's do the introduction. Numbers chapter 13, verses uh, 21 to 25. Moses comes up to the promised land. And there's a big debate 
as to whether we should go and take this land. This is the land that God has given them. But the Bible says they have to possess the land. That means to say you have to lay claim on it. There's a lot of blessings that God has in store for you, but you have to lay claim on it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You have to lay claim on it. God has already given it. There are some things you don't have to come and beg God for. He's already said it is yours. He says healing is the children's bread. You have to claim it. I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in good health. You have to claim it. The word of God has already declared it. So they have to possess the land. They have to take hold of it. They have to go in and claim it. There are enemies in the land. And there will always be enemies in the land. But what's yours is yours. If God says it's for you, it's for you. No matter what the enemy says, if it's for you, it's for you. And so they come to the promised land and Moses is sending out spies and he takes one person from all 12 tribes and he puts them together and he sends them out to spy out the land. And this crew is Joshua and Caleb. We're familiar with the story because Joshua and Caleb is, came back with good report. But where is God taking them as they are about to spy out this land? This is the first time they are going to enter into this land. Where is God going to take them? Watch this. So they went and spied out the land. They went into the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob. They came up there. Hebron is very hilly. There's a valleys, there are mountain tops. So they are traveling, they go into the land. They come near to the entrance of Hamath. And then they went through the south and they came to where? Where is God bringing them to? I wanted to see this. The very place as they go to take this land, to lay home of everything that God promised them. I'm going to take you out of bondage and I'm going to give you a promised land. The very first place that God brings them to is Hebron. Because Hebron is very significant. Hebron is going to play an important role in their life. The place that God wants to bring you to is that place of Hebron. Because Hebron speaks of oneness. It speaks of relationship. It speaks of friendship. I'm at, I'm at Sisha, if I'm pronouncing it correct. And tell me, I'm not, I'm not good with this pronunciation. Are the descendants of Anak, a, this is quite significant, were there. So the enemies were there. These are the three sons of Anak. The Anakites was in the land. They had large cities, established cities in the land. It was a prosperous land. They were built there the years before Zion and Egypt. Let's go on. Verse 23. They came to the valley of Eskal and they cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. Went to the, to the market yesterday. And uh, usually I would change some money when I'm going into the market. I will have it in my pocket so I don't have to always go in my wallet to take out money. And I realized that all the money that I change finish, but we now start to make the market. Now I, I can't get vexed because I mean it's the flood and everything, but I mean it's it's really expensive. And there were grapes, and uh, my wife went to buy some grapes, and she, I asked, "What's the price of the grapes?" And when we got the price, I says, "Well, we could eat that for Christmas." We don't need to eat it now. You know, let's let's eat it for Christmas. It's, it's a little a little pong of grapes. You know what I'm saying? But they made one cluster of grapes and they carried it between two poles, two persons on a pole. Two of them on a on a pole. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. Now, immediately you will understand. 
that this place that is called Hebron is a place of overflowing blessing. Come on. It's, it's a place of supply. It's a place of provision. It's a place that has more than enough. God wants to bring you to that place. He's bringing them to Hebron because it's a place of blessing. It's a fertile place. Are there enemies in the land? Of course there's enemies in the land. For 40 days they would have explored this land. 40 speaks of probation. 40 speaks of a days of turning around. Usually when somebody dies, you would have 40 days. I really don't agree with 40 days and 60 days and whatever. In my opinion, if you could have 40, well, if you're cooking, no problem. But you could, if you have 40, let's have a 60, let's have a 80, and let's have a 100. But 40 is a, is, a, is a day of provision. It's a day of probation, rather. They come back with the land and they give their report. Hebron speaks of a place of covenant. Write these terms down. I'm just throwing them at you because we, we're going to come back to them. We know it's oneness. It means friendship. It means relationship. It means covenant. Why is this important? It speaks of covenantal relationship. It speaks of covenantal positioning. It speaks of an alliance, of having a perfect relationship. It speaks of a place of blessing, a place of substance, a place of provision. But Hebron is located in Judea. And Judea speaks of praise. Have you seen how significant this is? In your journey to your destiny, you can never come into this place of redefining relationship unless you detach soul ties and separate yourself from the people who don't believe to the ones who is willing to come into. Listen to me. Twelve spies had the opportunity to place their foot on Hebron. They had the opportunity to take of the blessing and experience what Hebron had to offer. And yet came back to Moses and reported that they are giants in the land. They did not learn to redefine and have a clear perspective of what God wanted for them. And so God, I tell you this morning that you will never ever come into a place of true inheritance in Christ. Come to that place of Hebron unless you wholeheartedly have a relationship with him. For us to move into this perfect plan of God, we must be forging divine, genuine relationships. We are not building a Samaritan church. We are having diversity of spirits. We are maturing people in the body of Christ so that we can be united as one people. That's why I started this morning by saying, you have come to learn how to live, but I'm going to teach you how to die. Hebron can only develop when your season changes. And in this season, your association has to change. We cannot want the blessing, the covenantal blessing of Hebron and still have our feet planted over the Jordan. There has to be a movement from the house of Saul to the house of David. There has to be a, a movement from the ministry of John the Baptist to the ministry of Jesus. 
a consolidation of spirits different in body but in oneness and spirit you see I tell you this morning that you don't have to be friend with everybody but you can be friendly with everybody come on you don't have to be friend with everybody but you need to be friendly with everybody You cannot build with everybody. You cannot walk with everybody. You, nobody, not everybody is going to come into agreement with you. Why? Because they do not identify with your spirit. You will get that sometime during the, this week. Not everyone is going to agree with your cause, with your purpose, with your pursuit. There are people that will come into your life that will distract you and that will pervert your thinking. But there are things that you must resolve before you come into Hebron. Abraham had to be separated from Lot. God told him, remove yourself from your family. And I will pronounce this great blessing upon you. He took Lot with him in his journey. Watch the two individuals. Strife came amongst the herdmen of Lot and the herdsmen of Abraham. Strife came among them. Lot take that strife and bring it up between himself and Abraham. Now God has to separate them. Over those chapters, when Abraham was with Lot, and we read about Sodom and Gomorrah and everything that happened, the heavens were shut up and God does not speak to Abraham. And so, Abraham told Lot, I want you to see, see where you want and select. He, he selects the best land and he moves and he separates himself. And the moment he separates himself, we're going to go into deep. God moves Abraham and he brings him to Hebron. Are you understand what I'm saying? He takes Abraham and he brings him to Hebron. And when he reaches to Hebron, the Bible says that Abraham heard the voice of the Lord. And it is at Hebron, he told him, I will make your nation great. You will become the father of many nations. You can only come into that place of Hebron, a place of blessing, a place of covenant, when we learn how to separate ourselves and walk in oneness in Christ. So our understanding of being one with Christ is subject to our revelation of who Christ is. 1 John chapter 3 verses 1 to 3. Let's read it. 1 John chapter 3 verses 1 to 3. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called what the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. How are we joined in Christ? We are joined in spirit. God is spirit. That's who he is. God is spirit. And so they that worship him, worship him in spirit. How are we connected with him? How are we joined? We are joined in spirit because we are a triune being. So he knows us, we are connected with him, but the world does not understand that. They don't know why are we shouting, why are we making noise. For us, it's not noise. For us, it's excitement. We are rejoicing in the presence of God. We want to shout, we want to, we want to jump for joy, we want to serve God. We feel that our mortal body doesn't have enough strength in it to, to praise Almighty God because our spirit is going beyond our body. 
Our spirit is crying out and worship God, but our mortal body is subjected to our spirit, so our body cannot express the praises of God that the spirit wants to express. And they don't understand that. So we do that with words, we do that with action, we lift our hands, we shout before God, we dance before God, we allow our body to praise Him. Because we are in Christ. They shall see Him. Continue. Next verse. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as he is pure. Just as he is pure. We have to know him as he is. Hebron is mentioned 87 times in the Bible, and it is the world's oldest Jewish community. Joshua gave Hebron to Caleb. Caleb is from the tribe of Judah, part of the Levi. It's a priestly thing. And Caleb subsequently led the tribe of Joshua to conquer the city. Conquer the environments. And he gave the city, he gave Hebron the cities to Caleb. Hebron is separated for priestly people who are willing to come into that place. It is one of the highest towns in Philistine, the city of Arab. We had the opportunity when we were in Israel to go into Hebron, Palestine. And so you had to drive up, up to it. We had to change the, the, the tour that was moving with us. And so we had to get a tour guide from the Philistine community. It was very large. It was walled with gate. You cannot get into Philistine. And you have to get clearance to get in there. But you have to take a tour guide from Philistine to carry you into, into that area. And we had the opportunity to, to, to put our feet in the land of Philistine. And we walked, walked into Philistine and had, had the opportunity to see some of the, the churches that, that existed inside here. But it's, it's, it's a very nice country. It's, it speaks of confederation, alliance, where things get connected and it is weaved together. And I'm, I'm throwing this out to you because I'm going to pull it together. Hebron brings us into that oneness, into that one place. But let me, let me just close this up because of, of our time this morning. The Bible says that when Caleb and Joshua came, there were three cities and the three sons of Anak were there. Anak is the father of Arab. And out of Anak and his father, became the um, generation of the Anakites. The Anakites. This nation formerly were very large people. They were tall and they were very large. And so they were very warlike people. It is believed that David would have fought against Goliath, who was also an Anakite. So when they went into the city and they saw the size of the men, they came back and said that they are giants in the land. And they appropriated themselves as being as grasshoppers in front of these men. But Arab means four square. It speaks about perfect stature. Perfect stature. Anak produces perfection and not weakness. Ab means the strength of Baal. But I want to see, show you something very significant here. When they came into the land, they saw three cities that was ruled by the three sons of Arab. Shehan. Shehan means white, 
fine white linen. Fine white linen that speaks about purity. David would use these fine, well tread linen called the ephod. And he would dress the priests with this. They were dressed in this fine linen to signify that what the goodness of God is by grace. Salvation through grace. Salvation by grace through faith. Why am I sharing this with you this morning? Hebron speaks of a place of grace. It speaks of a place of pureness. It speaks of a place of holiness. The second person they found here was Ammonite. Ammonite means my brother is gifted. It talks about who is my brother or brotherly love. Have we seen how it's coming together? The third son was Talmia. And Talmia speaks about furrow, ridge, boldly spirited in suffering. Boldly spirited in suffering. When you're in that place of Hebron, it doesn't matter what you are going through. Because your character will be shaped in the furnace of suffering. In the furnace of suffering. God this morning is moving us. If for all the years you have gone to church, you have heard about the unity, the church must come into unity. I'm telling you this morning that God is moving you away from unity into a place of oneness. Oneness. And he demonstrates that by saying, if two shall agree, Show you this morning. Could you stand? This is my wife. We are, we are celebrating 30 years next week. Let me make sure I would correct her. I could get in trouble here. All right? 30 years of marriage. In 30 years of marriage, when we met, we made a covenant. A covenant relationship. Are you in? We come together. When I said I do and she said she will. We agreed that we are going to covenant together and that the two of us will become one. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. Not the neighbor wife. Cleave unto his wife and the two shall become one. How many people are you seeing here this morning? How many people God is seeing? One. How does the two become one? Because we are united in spirit. What is in her spirit is in my spirit. What is our purpose? It's one. What is our dream? One. What is our lifestyle? One. She stands in the authority of Sipasar. I stand in the authority. When she speaks, she speaks to her husband. When I speak, I speak. In the authority of my wife. We are one. Because God sees us as one. The two flesh. God bless you. The two flesh becomes one. If God can take two individuals from different walks of life. Different faces. Different places. And bring them together. And says now this two is one. They are no different. I see them as being one complete unit. Could he not do it with the church of Jesus Christ? If we are only living in unity, we're going to have division amongst us. But when we live in oneness, it keeps us into the covenant of God. 
So I tell you this morning, it's not about being united in the church. I can divide this church into five or six groups and all of us can be united in our own group and yet not have the same objective and purpose of the next group. It is about being one. What God sees is one church. He sees one body. He sees one group of people. We might be singing worship here in, in English and somebody singing worship in Chinese or in Japanese or, or you name it and whatever, but God still sees one church. And while there are diversity of worship, all goes up as a sweet smell and savor before his true. We are one. So it makes no difference whether I don't like Chelsea or whether Chelsea likes me. As long as God adds her into the house of God, she's one. Are you hearing me? I am obligated because we are now one in the body of Christ. We are one body. We are one people. We have one purpose. And you would never get up until you come into Hebron where you understand how to function as one. I'll show you Cain and Abel. It was easy to kill his brother because he did not see them as one. So when God came to him, he says, he asked him, where is thy brother? He didn't see him as a brother. If he saw him as a brother, you see, when you don't see somebody as your brother, it's very likely you will kill them. God had to remind him, where is your brother? And he says, am I my brother's keeper? In other words, do I have an obligation for him? Yes, you do. God says you do. And because you do, God is now bringing you into the place where he, he, you have to give an account of your brother. You know, it's strange. God won't ask you how many times did you go to church. But you have to give an account. Are you getting this this morning? So I'm giving you the foundational stuff. And then we're going to open it up and get the revelation that comes out of it. That comes out of Hebron. And hopefully by the next two or three sessions, we will come into a place as a body, as a church, where we are one with Christ. And in that place that you have come into, a place that is called Hebron, you will enjoy all the benefits that comes from Hebron. Everything that comes from Hebron, you will enjoy the benefits of it. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to open up your word that is so rich to us. So many truths, dear God. I pray this morning, dear Lord, as you guide us to come into that place that is called Hebron. For every word, for every thought that we have shared this morning, we may not remember everything. But allow your Holy Spirit to engrave in our hearts, dear Lord, your word. That your word become real and rich to us. That, oh God, we'll be able to take this word today. And we will have a passion and a zeal as we come, Holy Spirit, and say, every day that I learn, I want to come to understand more how I can come into that covenant relationship with you, how I can come into that place that is called Hebron, how I can come into oneness. Holy Spirit, allow us today to be blessed by this word as you bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.
And just like any other organization, we have taxes to pay and what have you. But what I want to get to you, you will see here tithes, and we're going to understand that you must pay your tithes. Offering, right? If you want to give a special offering, we are picking up our normal offering, but if you want to give a special offering, you can take it off there. Seed is what you sow, right? It's a part of giving. You sow seed. We talk about seed. Unless you sow seed, you don't have a harvest, right? So your tithes is obedience, right? Your tithes is what you give to God because that's the word of God. And what your tithe do? The tithe does two very important things. It opens up the windows of heaven. God says, prove me if I will not open the windows of heaven and allows the blessing to come down. So sometimes we shut up the windows of heaven because we don't pay tithes, right? And the second thing that tithe does is that it restrains the devourer. Have you ever been working for your money and all spending out and you know what it, where it go in? The washing machine break down, the TV go on, the this, and all of a sudden your money finish and you're struggling. You're not supposed to be struggling. We taught that in this church. You're supposed to be drawing from the source. You're not supposed to be living from a portion. You're supposed to be living from a source. Even, even the woman of Zarephath experienced that. She was able to draw because the man of God was there. So you, sometimes we create our own problem because we, do, we are not obedient. Last week, Tuesday, we talked about being obedient. Steps in being obedient. So what does tithe do? Tithe restrains the devourer. And you find that the little that you have is stretched. You are able to do so much stuff, right? And I can testify of that. Where we are today is because we have learned to be faithful in tithing. Seed is you sow because you want a harvest later down. When you see farming comes and farming will come just as storms come. When that farming comes, you are able to have and draw from the bands because you sowed seed. And that's why I always tell people, Christian people should not be going around begging. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you do the right thing, you will be blessed. Right through the COVID, everything. We did more work here in the COVID more than anything else. Why? Because we sow seeds and you are able to draw from a harvest. Mission is all the work that we do outside. If you want to sow into mission, you put, you put it in and all of these are tracked separately. You sow into mission and we take that and all the works that we are doing, evangelistic work, we do it, we use the mission. Building fund is any extension. You see we're doing a work like right now we're going to work on the car park. We ex we fix in the car park. That will go towards that. So you want to sow especially in some project and building. And pastor's gift is the most important one. You understand that? So you want to bless the man of God. You have been blessed with the word. Whatever. You know, it's always nice to, to give the pastor's gift. So um, we put that there because we have. We, it's important you learn how to give honor. How to honor we talked about that right so when you put your funds here please tick it off the area right what it is for so we will know how to assign it right we assigned it to those different areas so let's lift our, our love gift our tithes our offering as you have father we thank you for the opportunity to give and we pray that even now dear God as we are obedient to your word that you're going to bless both the gift and the giver in jesus name amen amen so as giver we are going to get into some announcements for the sake of time right first of all i want to say a special thanks for all of you we had a we had a, a tremendous time in our family day it was um, enjoyable it was successful um, it created the opportunity for us as a church to to do something that will stretch us and you did, you all did such a wonderful job. I walked around, I felt so proud as a pastor to see everybody doing their work and representing well and having quite a success. Everybody were enjoying themselves. But it only became successful because you did your part. It means that you learned well, you represented well. And now we could stretch you a little more. We could give you something bigger to do. So first of all, thank you very much on behalf of the board and my, um, and my wife. We, we really appreciate it. So let's see where we are. Um, Celine could put up that. We shared it on Tuesday night in case you missed it. So I just want to give you an update with the family day expenses, uh, right? Um, are we right? So some some kind of mess here. So we had different boots: the hot dog and drinks boot. We had all these expenses um, and the hot dog. 
All the bread for the hot dogs was donated by Sister Lisa from California and Brother Terrence. So we didn't have to incur any cost in the bread. All the other stuff right, is what we purchased. Um, the hot dogs and the ketchup and whatnot uh, was subsidized by Sister Nita. Right? We got that at a cost price and plus she covered some cost uh, from premium. And it came up to $1,376 on that boot. The cotton candy was assisted by Sister Victoria, right? And some of the stuff she had, she placed that in. And her boot only cost us $60. The popcorn boot, right? Of course, the bag and the popcorn, that cost us $170. The ice cream and snow cone boot, um, I think they eat out plenty of the ice cream before they share it to the children. Uh, because I think we put it wrong. We put a man who like ice cream by the ice cream. Yes. <laughs> but he ate none. <laughs> all right. So ice cream and the snow cone and all the other stuff came up $414. Right? The manicure boot, we had no cost assigned to the church. Right? The, um, Sister Crystal and their team, they covered their cost and all what they had to get. And they run their boot. That, that was very nice. Um, they, they, they had a manicure boot. The wildlife presentation, we, we gave a donation of $500 for the guy who came and did the wildlife presentation, right? All the pet boot, we have all the fishes and the rabbits was donated by Amy and, and her group. Sister Kalauti gave us um, the fishes, Sister Amy, and then the rabbits with um, Farisha and all of them, they donated the rabbits. We had some duckling donated by Tony and we had, we had other stuff that we bought. And that only cost us $126 overall. That's all we had to put out, which was excellent, right? And we had the games room. No cost was assigned to that. You know, um, Sister Celine they and their team, they covered their costs with all these things that they had to get for the games room. Then we had some handicraft and some toys that was donated by Chelsea and Sister Shoba, right? That they donated all the toys and, and some bags and whatnot. And that covered that area. So our total cost was $2,640, which is excellent. I mean, for the capacity in which we had, we had over 250 people that came in here and lots of kids that was enjoying themselves. Uh, and that was the cost. The mission, or those of you who would have put on the mission here for July and August, when we indicated to you to put it, right? We collect $3,390. So we were able to use out of that fund and offset our expenses, which was really good. So those expenses, so going forward, as you continue to put on the mission, um, we are going back to Maula, we are going to have our services, all these services where we do um, hampers and, and the kids' bags and distribution, all those things go on the mission. So if we don't have the amount on the mission, well, we'll have to take out, out of the church fund and subsidize it. But you will find that I will not come to you and say, hey, I need a pong of sugar, I need this. That's not my style, right? We're asking you to be faithful in giving, and we manage that, right, as best as we can to ensure that we can do what we are doing. So a lot of momentum is building, and with momentum, there's a lot of expenses that is incurred. So continue to give. We have absolutely no problem with people giving in this church. So I just want to encourage you to continue to give, continue to sow, so that we can continue to establish and extend the kingdom of God. During the course of this week, uh, we are heading into one week of prayer, right? Pray and fast. And that's going to happen September, October, November, the first week. Uh, it's going to be Monday to Thursday. There will be no intercessory on uh, Tuesday morning so that it will not add that extra burden on you. But we want you to come out on Tuesday evening. While we start at half past six, the church will be open up a little earlier. We will ask them to make the church available. So if you want to come earlier and spend some time in prayer, that will be appreciated. But we will start half past six in a normal time until about eight o'clock. We'll be also doing a special teaching over the course of these four days. We'll take some time to do some, some word with you. But it's about praying. It's a prayer meeting. So in other words, we are meeting to pray. Right? So we want you to come. And it's just four days. It won't kill you. Any of you die yet? Then I wanted to do 21 days. But I feel that one would kill you. Yeah, nah, nah. So we are going into four days. Right? Of fast and prayer. Why is that important? With all the momentum, everything that is building, all the activity, 
it is also important that we regroup right just like an army army has to come in back get some rest train and go all back again so we have to regroup we strengthen each other in prayer we pray with each other we pray for one another we strengthen each other so that when we go again we have the strength to move it is not done in self it's done with the strength of god so that's where the regrouping come in and i want to applaud you we have a very good response in our prayer meeting make some time see if you can come out monday to thursday this week from half past six to about half past seven quarter to eight so it's not going to be long it's just an hour of praying together right that means we have no live group this week so all the live group will start off continue will not start off continue next week next week you will continue with your live group if you are not part of a live group we will ask you to become part of our live group could i ask all our live group leaders just to stand so you can see some face live group leaders right we have Celine in the back we have Terence and Krista we have Monica and Mohan we have Nita who are missing somebody and Sheldon and Pebbles is in our in our group so we have Tamsin so you can see the faces of these people there are six live groups live group is designed for us to come together to discuss so like we shared this morning then the live group meets and they discuss the message so they break it down into bite sides and they are able to share with one another what you didn't understand all them kind of stuff you're able to share it and get that message because by tomorrow morning half of you forget this tomorrow morning you forget me much as the message so it's coming back together to go through it back again digest it and you create a family in that group that you have right some of the groups are meeting they have in fellowship together they you know it's just having a wonderful time you you belong and so we would like you to be a part of that if you are not in a group join with a group so that you can be a part of that group but there'll be no meeting this week and then all the group will go back in for next week next week also there's all the live group coming in for wednesday thursdays right so all the live group are meeting on a thursday night on a wednesday night next week we will let you know we are going to start the training with all our baptismal people all the candidates that got baptized right and in addition to anyone else who wants to join level one we have three levels of training that we take you through level one understanding the culture and doctrine of our church level two is going a little more deeper into deeper stuff and strengthening you and level three is leadership if you want to get involved in, in doing leadership stuff and thing we train you and what is expected as a leader so i'll be taking you through level one right all those people first but you may also say well i want to be a part of it because it's understanding the basics of doctrine we're going to go through that and after that we're going to take them into membership we're going to have a wonderful Sunday morning where we take them into membership. So that's going to happen over the next few Wednesday nights, four to five Wednesday night. We'll be meeting with them in the training room and going through that. On October the 9th, right on that date, October the 9th, we are promise, promising to take you back to the beach, right? We had a wonderful time in our baptism, right? Some people had more wonderful time than others, but it was good. Yeah, that's right. and we had a wonderful time of fellowship so this is what we are planning to do you don't have to cook we will cook for you if you don't eat pork we'll cook all right but we will cook so we are planning to have a, a barbecue we are going back we have a nice facility right i'll arrange with chelsea to see if we get it again and it can accommodate everybody we were there for our baptism it's right library it's not far and it's private we can go down to the beach who wants to be so we're going to have a short service first you will come prepared that just after service we can drive up there and as we go up there we will barbecue we will you know prepare lunch with everybody so we can have together so you don't have to prepare anything we will prepare everything all we want you is to come and just enjoy the fellowship be we have chefs we have chefs in this in this church so we're going to put the chefs um in the fire let them let them do their work and and we will do the tasting and the eating right so we are just going to have a wonderful evening of fellowship right after we have teach this whole message on oneness we're going to experience oneness right 
and no better way to experience oneness than with food. Good. So we're gonna come together and just have a one. So keep that date in mind. Make your arrangement. October the 9th, we are planning. So that's the day you don't have to cook. I'll save you some money, right? Ladies can relax. The men will arrange all the cooking. We just want you to be relaxed and enjoy being in the bed in the beach. Come back and enjoy the fellowship. So all who want to join us, feel free. Just let me know. Now transport will be a limited thing. So if you can start by now by making arrangement for your transport, um, that will be nice. Because if we have to rent a vehicle, it will cost too much. So if we can accommodate as much as we can, we will do that. Good. So that's some of the major stuff that is happening. Well, it was good having you this morning. I'm going to send you away now. Let's stand. All those who are visiting with us, you know, we, we are glad to have you. You know, we want to be a part of what's taking place. And we look forward in seeing you on our next week's service. Amen. So lift your hands right where you are. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to grace your house. We thank you for your word, for the time of worship. I thank you for every person that took the time to be here this morning. And I pray, dear Lord, your blessing upon them. I pray your grace upon their life. I pray your protection over the course of this week, dear Lord. Bless their going out and their coming in. May we have peaceable night and joy as we rise up every morning. We continue to commit ourselves even for this week of prayer, dear God, and fasting. I pray, dear Lord, that all those, dear Lord, that will make themselves available, that you will reward them, dear God, with blessing that come from your throne. Even those that cannot make it, dear Lord, but Father, you will touch them today. So we go with the grace of God. We go with the blessings of God. We go with the anointing of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We love you. We appreciate you. God bless you.